Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm an alcoholic. Josh. Um, my sobriety date is July 3rd, 2010. Uh, this is my home group. And I have a sponsor and a sponsee. So get that out of the way. Um, and I don't really want to do this right now. So <laughs> This has been my home group for about four years now. And um, I've done the 15-minute speaker like several times and never really felt like I got to let my like wings spread and really let you know all the deep, awesome things that I have to say and the wisdom that I have to bestow upon you. So we'll see how this one works out. I haven't really thought about it much, though. So... Um, so uh, I was uh, born, um, that doesn't matter, whatever. <laughs> um, I did not grow up uh, in an alcoholic household. Um, and I always feel like it's important to say that because um, I don't think that it is a prerequisite to be an alcoholic and a member of this program. Many people did grow up in a pre in an alcoholic household, and that and that you know obviously has a drastic impact upon your relationship with alcohol um, growing up. But I grew up in a house with two very highly functional, loving parents that um, gave me everything that I needed, and I never for a moment ever questioned whether I was loved or supported or anything like that. Um, and I still ended up in these rooms. <laughs> So, um, so, <laughs> so, um, you know, and that's, and that's not to say that I didn't, that, that I didn't have, um, some challenges growing up. Uh, I would say that the primary thing kind of that, uh, maybe made our family unique, uh, growing up is I had an older brother who was three years older that was born with a, uh, like a rare digestive system disorder and he wasn't supposed to live like first day, week, month, year. I think my parents pretty much spent about the first year of his life, uh, and, you know, trading off, spending the night in the hospital and stuff like that. Um, but eventually he, he came home and lived a relatively normal life. Uh, he was fed intravenously at night because his body couldn't get the nutrients from food, but he ate food, just didn't really, you know, um, and he had surgeries and he would be in the hospital at times and stuff, but he went to school and, and, you know, for the most part lived a relatively normal life, um, which, which was, you know, great for the family. Um, he was, uh, not really that nice to me though. <laughs> um, <laughs> which like, you know, big brother, little brother thing. Like, I mean, a lot of it was, I think, typical stuff. Um, but I also think that he was probably pretty angry at the world for his, like, his situation and there's not a lot of outlets to like take that anger out on on a regular basis and your scrawny little brother is like a very simple one to do that so um so i i think you know i don't necessarily have a bunch of horrible memories of of uh, our relationship growing up and you know we shared a room and that kind of stuff was like it was fine for the most part, and it wasn't a physical thing. He wasn't, like, big. It wasn't, like, physical fights, um, but it was a lot of just emotional manipulation that big brothers do and that kind of stuff. And I think I was just always seeking approval, um, you know, from him uh, as little brothers do. Uh, and so I think that's, like, those, the, those feelings of, like, just not feeling good enough um, – the first place I can really like pinpoint those would probably be in that relationship with my brother, just feeling like, like nothing I did ever got any approval from him. He would do anything he could to like embarrass me or, or make me feel ostracized and stuff. And, um, and that's a feeling that like I, I can remember and then started to impact other parts of my lives completely separate from that sibling relationship. Um, so I, you know, I, I, uh, I, a feeling that I can also remember having for as long as I can remember is this like paralyzing, like <laughs> paralyzing, like, uh, of, like I care so much about what other people think about me. Like, and I really, really want you to like me and think that I am like cool and smart and special. Um, 
And so from an early age, like I would do what I could in order to get people to, to like me or, or laugh at my jokes or whatever it was. And humor was usually the easiest thing for me as a young child. Um, I wasn't like especially athletic. Um, you know, I did fine in school and was like pretty smart, but that didn't really mean that like that make you cool. So if I would like <laughs> make fart jokes in kindergarten, like that made everybody laugh. Even if I got sent to the principal's office, it was totally worth it because, like, you know, I, I felt that, like, acceptance that I think I'd been looking for from other people. Um, so, yeah, I can just always remember that feeling. And that's something that didn't go away when I got sober. You know, I still, uh, in work and personal relationships and the meetings and, and everything, you know, it's like it's, it's hard for me not to um, try, like, try to impress people. Um, and it's gotten better, but... Anyway, uh, I think next next big thing for me is uh, so is my spiritual path that I've gone on. Um, I like we went to church growing up, but my parents were like very like chill about it. I think they were very much the like we're gonna go to this very milk toast Protestant church so the kids have a nice place to go and meet people and stuff like that. But it's not. It wasn't like. You know, my parents weren't telling me, like, you're going to face eternal damnation if you do these bad things around the house or whatever, or I didn't feel a lot of pressure um, in that way. But uh, for whatever reason, I got, like, super into church, um, kind of on my own volition. And uh, and part of that was I had this best friend who he went to a kind of more, like, rah-rah church that I went to with him. And I think I was kind of like, well, I mean, if this stuff is true... Like, that's a pretty big deal, so you might as well get super into it, because, <laughs> like, you're going to go to hell and burn forever if you don't. So <laughs> that was my, like, you know, fifth grade logic. Um, so anyway, so I got, like, really into church, um, and, like, I even, like, listened to Christian music for a while, which was cool, some Christian rap. Um, yeah, it was, it was sweet. Um so anyway, that that continued um, through high school and even into college where, you know, I that's something that I identified myself with was like a, a good Christian boy. And um, and I like was super involved in the church and would go on mission trips and like all that kind of good stuff. And so I became like um, I became concerned with keeping up that aspect of my personality and like how people perceive that that became part of my identity and people like liked that for the most part like I at my high school it was really weird like the good kids kind of like were well respected for the most part I mean people partied and did all that kind of stuff but like you know I got like a lot of people really liked the fact that I was like this good boy that did did all that stuff so anyway so I, I didn't drink a lot um in high school because that wasn't what you did. Um, and, you know, I think there was two parts of that. Like, part of it is I just wanted to maintain that that uh, facade that I put up that, like, this is what I do because I'm this type of person. And also, um, you know, when I think back, like, I was very involved in the church, but I would not say that I had, like, a really deep-seated spiritual connection at the time. It was very much about that, like, like lifeguard God that is, like, don't run at the pool. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to run at the pool because there's, like, big consequences if you run at the pool a whole bunch. Um, and so I, you know, I wanted to, like, make sure I was doing the right things. Um, and also I wanted to maintain that, that like, perception of that I was this good boy that, that didn't do that. But when I did drink the handful of times, it was, like, really intense. <laughs> and I blacked out, like, and threw up every single time and really, really loved it. But there was this, like, incredible sense of shame that I had because of it. I always just felt like afterwards, like, oh, I'm so, like, weak that I would do that. Um, and so it happened a handful of times in high school where I did drink, um, but I was very ashamed of it and wanted to keep it secret. Didn't want people to know, um, but I really loved the way that it felt. Um so anyway, I went to college and uh, and kind of drinking started to progress in a very normal like college type way. Um, I you know still was involved in church stuff, but was drinking more and more, and still had like a very strange relationship with it, where like I thought about it a lot, even if I wasn't doing it a lot. Um, I would think about it, and I would think about that next time I was going to be doing it, and like what would happen, and how would that feel, and how could I make sure that I was able to get as much as possible without people really knowing how much I had. 
Um, and so it progressed pretty naturally. And, you know, I had plenty of like crazy, wild, drunken college times. I was in a fraternity, um, which, you know, they'd like teach you to drink even more there, which was fun. Um, and so, yeah, lots of, you know, lots of blackouts, lots of waking up in hotel lobbies in my underwear, not knowing how to get back into my room. I was reminded of that story last night. Um, lots of like, w like coming out of a blackout after just peeing in my friend's refrigerator. Uh, just like little low key things like that, that were, that were like probably not super normal. Um, but, uh, so that kind of es that escalated pretty progress pretty normally. Um, and then uh, there was kind of this summer of my life that, uh, between my junior and senior year of college that like everything shifted and a bunch of stuff happened. Um, one thing was, is, uh, and, and, you know, drugs are a part of my story, um, is I smoked pot for the first time and, um, I liked that a lot. Uh, and I became a quick uh, fan of making that a part of every single experience I could make it a part of. Um, so that was part of it. Um, I got out of a relationship with this girl that I dated in college that, you know, I thought that I loved and was going to be together forever. And she broke up with me. So I was, you know, heartbroken over that. Um, a good friend of mine went through like a personal tragedy a lot of different stuff and and for whatever reason all part of that like kind of culminated into my drinking and drug use like spiking very quickly and also me making this conscious decision like I am no longer a Christian um which which I don't regret that choice but I think that I kind of like um took my anger at God a little too far. Um, so anyway, so from that point on, basically, um, you know, I, I was really using alcohol and drugs in a super unhealthy way. Um, and, uh, using it to, I think, numb a lot of the feelings that I had, using it so that I didn't have to deal with a lot of the feelings, using it so I could be in whatever social situation I wanted to, using it to make things more fun, using it for whatever situation I could. Um, and for the spiritual aspect of it, like, I didn't just be like, I wasn't just the type of person that was like, you know, that's not really for me, but like, good for you. You know, everybody has their own road, like, you know, many windows, one light type sort of magical spiritual. I didn't have that kind of wisdom. I was like, that is not true. And I'm going to read all these books about atheism and about how you can prove scientifically that God is not true because I am angry and I do not believe in God. And so I kind of like veered that other way where like I tried to like specifically cut off my spiritual connection. Um, and so, you know, typical ex uh, like escalation over the next several years, um, just started to drink and use more and more, started to do it every single day, started to, you know, do it more and more during the week, even if I had to work the next day, all that kind of stuff. Um, but in general, I was always like very good at maintaining that like facade of like, oh, Josh, like he's a really nice guy. He's pretty funny. And I like to hang out with him. Like that was not an issue because I was so concerned with people liking me still that I like did whatever I could to manage other people's perception of me to still get them to like think that I was this great guy. Um, and so I, I, I think like most people on the outside, if they would have looked at me, they would have been like, Josh, like he has, he's, a, he has a pretty good character. Like he's a good person. He seems to help people. Um, he seems to like care that kind of stuff. Like, um, and that was all like, the fact that they were saying that meant that I had won. Like I had succeeded in this thing of like, this is why I'm doing it. So I think I did do a lot of those things that like, you know, um, people would associate with being a good person, but it was not to actually help other people. It was not to actually like give to this world. It was to like feel good about myself and build up my own self-perception. And uh, I, I was looking through the 12 and 12 and something. So this is from step seven in the 12 and 12 says, true, most of us thought good character was desirable, but obviously good character was something one needed to get on with the business of being self-satisfied. With a proper display of honesty and morality, we'd stand a better chance of getting what we really wanted. But whenever we had to choose between character and comfort, the character building was lost in the dust of our chase after what we thought was happiness. 
Seldom did we look at character building as something desirable in itself, something we would like to strive for, whether our instinctual needs were met or not. We never thought of making honesty, tolerance, and true love of man and God the daily basis of living. And I think a lot of people would have been like, Josh like, is a pretty honest, tolerant, great guy, but like that was not my basis of living. That was not what was driving me. Like Getting more alcohol and drugs was, was driving me after a while. Um, so anyway, um, progressed, progressed, progressed. Um, typical stuff. I had a job, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And then, uh, and then like I started to, um, it's the last two years or so of my drinking, it really progressed. And, and part of that was because I was like adding a lot of other drugs into the mix and like really, really abusing a lot of different things at once. But it got to the point where like, I would, I mean, I did not draw a sober breath. I mean, I would drink in the morning. I would do whatever I had all day long whether I was at work, um, you know, whatever it was. And it was complicated because I was, uh, I was in a relationship at the time, like living with this woman um, and, sh and like hiding it all from her. Like I, like I think d while we were together, if somebody asked, they're like, oh yeah, Josh, like he likes to go out and have a few drinks or like he smokes pot every once in a while. And it's like, no, I was like the entire time, every single memory that we have together I was high and drunk and maybe throw a couple other fun things on top of there. Um, which, uh, like, that's a bummer. That feels bad to do that to somebody. Um, and so, you know, I had a couple years of doing that and hiding it and, and all that kind of stuff, and it pretty much just hit its breaking point. Um, and so that, that was one of the, one of the big kind of things for me um, that, that brought me here. Another thing that, as I go back... Um, one other thing that happened was like when I was about 25, I almost got a DUI, got pulled over and blew like a .078 and only because I wasn't drinking that night. Like <laughs> that's what I told people, like, I'm not going to drink that tonight. I'll just have like three beers. And so luckily I like, cause I was driving home, I, I blew under, but I still got charged with the UI and I had to go to court and do all the typical rigmarole, rigmarole they make you do. But anyway, I knew that I had to get, um, I knew that I had to get drug tested as part of the like alcohol assessment intake thing. I knew that I'd talked to a lawyer friend. And so I stopped doing drugs for like several months because I knew I was going to have to get tested. And it, it was not that challenging. Um, and I say that because um, I was never able to stop drinking. Um, and so even though drugs were a part of my story and there's something that was a very big part of like what brought me to my knees faster, um, I identify as an alcoholic because I was able to give those up when there were circumstances that dictated that I needed to. And, uh, and I was never able to, to give up alcohol until I came here. Um, anyway, so basically things progressed to the point where I was just like spiritually, emotionally, financially bankrupt. I mean, every single thing that, like, I, I just woke up and dreaded every single day. Um, and I don't think I ever had any, like, real suicidal thoughts, but, like, I kind of thought I was probably just going to die somehow, right? Like, you can't just go through life being, like, messed up all the time and, like, not have it eventually catch up to you. So I was kind of like, well, I'll probably just die, and that'll be cool. Like, I don't want to have to deal with all this stuff. Um, and... I, I wish I could say there was like one thing that brought it there, but for whatever reason, I just was like, it's, it's time. It's, it's, I need to figure out what to do. So I like, uh, I came clean, mostly clean. I mean, you know, you don't have to tell all the details, but I came clean with that woman that I've been dating with my parents. Um, you know, I was like, I, I have a substance abuse problem. I drink and smoke weed too much and this and that. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know, like, what I would be doing. I don't think I really knew very much about AA. I think I knew more about rehab. Like, I'd had a couple friends that had gone to rehab and stayed sober for whatever reason. So I was like, maybe that'll fix me. Um, and so, you know, my parents were, like, supportive of that. And they're like, you know, you should go talk to somebody, figure out what the best plan of attack is. So I went to an uh, outpatient rehab program, which was helpful. Um, you know, they... It gave me somewhere to be for three hours a day in those first 30 days of sobriety um, where I just, that's what I needed. Um, and you had to go to meetings for it, which is what kept me sober. Um, and so I went to that and then, um, you know, they told you, they told me you have to have a sponsor. You got to find a sponsor. And so I was like, okay, like, 
you know, I, I like to get good grades and things. Um, so I'll do the things that you need to do to, like, be the top student in this rehab class. Um, and so I went to a meeting. So And, and the counselor at the rehab place was great. Uh, he, was, he was a man who's, who's still active in the program. I still see him around. I mean, wonderful. You know, I, I feel very, very uh, grateful that he's the person that was my counselor there. And he, you know, the, the rehab was on the east side because I was working there at the time, but, um, but he lived in Seattle and I wanted to go to Seattle meetings and he like circled meetings in the meeting book. And he's like, these are good ones and they were good ones. And so um, uh, one of the first meetings I went to, I don't remember anything about the first meeting I went to, and I definitely did not raise my hand and introduce myself. So kudos to anybody who does that. That's a huge amount of courage. Um, it gets easier. Please keep coming back. Um, uh, but one of the first meetings I went to was uh, a men's meeting that that the, that guy had circled, and I met this guy, who you know he just spoke with with like a calmness and, and like a resoluteness, and uh, he he immediately introduced. I did introduce myself at that meeting because I'd been to a few at that point, and I felt more comfortable this meeting. So I you know introduced myself and said I probably had like seven days or something at the time, and um, and he came up to me afterwards, <laughs> and uh, and this was a Saturday morning, and I was like okay like going to a meeting, that's a good thing. And I remember I chatted with him about six, so uh, what meeting are you going to tonight? I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Didn't I just go to a meeting? <laughs> You're crazy. Um, but we made plans to go to a meeting that night and the next night, and I quickly asked him to be my sponsor, and um, he was one of the most active people in this program that I've ever I've ever known. Um, he had just moved here from from out of state, and so he'd only been here for a couple of weeks. So it worked out really well because he knew the program, he knew what to do, I knew the city. So we went to a meeting together pretty much every day for the next several years. Um, and he very early um, taught me the kind of foundational things that I needed to know um, to to be successful in this program. And um, one of those was service. Um, so a couple things there I remember. Like, I was probably a week sober, two weeks sober. He's like, let's go down to the Salvation Army. They have some open meetings there. You know, those guys need help. Um, and, like, very quickly, I was, you know, driving these guys with a week of sobriety. And I had a month of sobriety. I was driving them to meetings all over the place. And, like, you know, what a what a gift. What a, what a, what a, like, a genuine opportunity to be of service and to help somebody. I also remember him. We chose this, but with, we chose this meeting as our home group because that's one of the ones that 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 guy had circled we went the first week and i could tell he was kind of like eh, but you know i think that's typical when you move from out of state and you go to new meetings and he's like okay we'll make that the home group he's like i noticed they didn't have greeters next week we're going to show up and we're going to be greeters and i was like <laughs> okay <laughs> because it like wasn't the home group meeting for another three weeks so we didn't like get to officially join it so like uh service was was a huge part of it uh that that you know, for me, that that's that uh, daily accountability with him and going to meetings on a regular basis early was huge. Um, I don't know if I did 90 and 90, but it was pretty close. It was pretty close to like 365 and 365. Um, and uh, and that's just what it was. And it was like every day. And, and you know, we, we started to get other people um, that would hang out. And we kind of had this posse of guys that would like go to a lot of meetings and get together and talk about stuff. Um, and that was super helpful. And then, you know, you get to know more people and you get to be a part of the fellowship. And, and that was super helpful for me. Um, you know, working the steps with him was really valuable. Um, my spiritual connection had been like severed. Um, and for whatever reason, I was like just very willing to listen about what the, all that stuff was early on. And maybe I was even like waiting to get some answers. Someone's gonna be like, this is what it is. And nobody ever did that. They were just like, you can make it what you want it to be. Um, and so, you know, working the steps with him, like just opened up my heart to this, the realm of the spirit, like, which if like, you know, 2006 Josh heard that, he would have been like, you are crazy and you need to shut your mouth and science can prove you wrong. Um, but that doesn't matter. Um, I, it's just like, I, uh, I know there's something greater than me out there. And I know that I get a certain feeling when, um, when I do certain things, like get quiet, help other people, um, you know, listen when people are talking instead of just talk about myself. 
um, some of the things that I learned in this program have brought me to a point where I can expand my like idea and perception of what a spiritual life is. Um, and that came as a direct result of working the steps. Um, you know, I had to take a look at what I had done. Um, I had to take a look at who I was really when you peel away all these other things. Um, and it wasn't until I did that, that I could really have like some sort of connection there. Um, another thing that I learned the value uh, of was having a home group and making that a big part of your life. This has been my home group for, like I said, about four years. And, um, and it's, it's like having a place every week, you know, you're going to go where you're going to see people who care about you, where you're going to get an opportunity to help other people out, when you're going to get an opportunity to hear things that are going to help you. Like, that's invaluable. Like, no, people people don't have that in this world. You know, some people do. They have it from their church or they have it from, from other things. But, like, um, it's incredible. And we get to do things like have dances and um, have chili feeds and uh, celebrate each other's birthdays and, um, you know, go out after the meeting and do these things that just help keep me plugged in um, as, as the world gets busier. Um, so, yeah, sponsorship, service, meetings, home group, all those things that you hear early on, um, those are the things that help, help keep me here. Um, and... Uh, you know, this last year has been like a really interesting time. Um, so a little more than a year ago, that sponsor that had been my sponsor my first four years um, left the program. Um, and it was an interesting experience. Um, and uh, what I learned is that like my sobriety is not dependent upon any other individual person um, because he had been like... I didn't even have to think almost when I had been working with him because like I could just follow and just follow his example and know that I was going to be doing something that was going to put me in a good situation. And that got taken away. Um, and I stayed sober, you know, I got a new, got a new sponsor. It's a very different relationship. Um, stayed in the home group, you know, I kept doing the service that we were doing and, uh, and I'm still here. Um, other things have happened too in this last year. You know, I've gotten a lot busier. My first four years of sobriety was like, even though a lot of like personal tragedies, people died, people overdosed, people went to the hospital, different things like that. Like my own personal stuff didn't really change that much. I had the same job, you know, I had good like roommates, like all that kind of stuff the first four years to where like I could pretty much like um, go to a meeting almost every day and I could do things that, that, uh, that, that helped me build up that foundation. This last year has gotten really, uh, a lot of things have changed, you know. Um, I am in a relationship with a wonderful woman that, that I need to make sure that I nurture that relationship um, so that I can be of service in that relationship. Uh, I got a new job, um, which is a job that I did a long time ago, um, and I'm doing it again, and it's in the same industry, but it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and I really want to be good at it, which is totally different than when I was like 23 years old doing that job. And I was like, when can I get out of here so I can smoke weed and start drinking and watching like 24 marathons? Um, uh, so things have changed. Um, but the one thing that hasn't changed is like this, this program helps keep me grounded. It helps keep me away from the next drink. It helps with my connection to a higher power. Um, it helps. I have wonderful personal relationships with people that like genuinely care about me and I can talk to about pretty much anything. Um, and, and I, I'm just really grateful for that. Um, that's all I have to say. Goodbye. Hello, my name is Akita. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, uh, my sobriety date is November 28th, 2006. Um, my home group and current service position are undecided, uh, but you know, whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll do that soon enough. Um, uh, but I do have a sponsor who I was meeting with on a regular basis. Oh, this is not sounding really good now that I say it out loud. Um, but, but I do have some sponsees who I meet with on a regular basis, and that's uh, one of the real bright spots of my sobriety that I get to see these guys and I get to see, um, I get to meet up with them and watch how their lives change and, uh, you know, see these people who really want this thing. And it really reminds me of, um, the, the, what, what a gift 
all of us who are in here right now have the opportunity to have either have or have the opportunity to get for ourselves and um so yeah it's i don't know this is a pretty good gig that we have uh so i guess i'll start from the from the beginning um my first drink i think i was probably like 13 14 i remember it pretty well uh so i had older siblings and my brother used to have parties and stuff and um it was after one of his parties there was nobody was at home and there was like a cooler or like a tub kind of with ice in it and a bunch of leftover beers and i was there by myself and i and like having older siblings i always had like people kind of um the like older siblings who were kind of like well known and well liked in our town and stuff uh like older people are always like if i was acting goofy they'd be like oh akita stone like akita must be drunk or something i'd be like i i'm not i'm a kid you know and uh and so but i was always really curious about it just because i heard people talking about it. i saw these older kids drinking all the time you know i saw these older kids doing other stuff all the time and uh and i wanted to just know about it so when i was there and i was by myself and i saw this stuff i was like all right let me go find out and um i remember i took out uh a 40 ounce bottle of um crazy horse malt liquor and uh and i remember i remember what, like what the sky looked like i remember what like the air felt like and i remember tasting it like that first taste of it and being like this is delicious and um and i liked i liked it so much i didn't i didn't quit drinking because i didn't like the taste of it you know like i'm the kind of drunk who really enjoyed drinking and um and not not just like not just the effect you know it I, I liked it. I liked, like, most of the stuff about it. Uh, and from then, you know, like, I drank, and then I, like, got bugged out and went and, like, crashed my bike or something. And uh, and then I kind of, it was hard for me to get alcohol. Like, I was a short kid, so it was hard to get access to it. Um, so, like, uh, but getting weed was easy because, like, you get weed in school. Like, anybody can get weed in school if, you're, if you ask. And, uh, and so... <laughs> Um, so I smoked a lot of weed and I did that by myself too, you know, because I wanted to know. So I'd like, like, I had to experiment with everything that I could because I didn't know anything, you know, so like bending up cans and trying to get creative and engineering in my window of my bedroom. And, um, and then eventually like finding the other kids who were down to do that stuff and doing more and more. And then it became like, get a little bit older and uh, like the high school stuff was a blast. Like, I, I had a lot of fun then, and I feel like that's kind of the, uh, at least in my, my story, that's kind of like the, the bait on the hook a little bit. Because, like, I had a lot of fun for a certain amount of time. And, um, like, no real consequences having the older siblings and, like, people like my parents and stuff. So I was kind of made in the town that I was in, and I got out of a lot of trouble. You know, I didn't have very many steep consequences. So I really had, like, the, the but I didn't learn anything. You know, all I learned how to do was, like, get wasted and, like, do whatever I felt like doing, you know, and, like, kind of just, like, raise hell. And uh, and that was it. Like, that, those were those were my defining character traits, was I was the kid who would, if there was any kind of booze, if there was any kind of drug, I'd do it. And we'd go out and we'd get loaded, and then we'd go raise hell and do something crazy, you know. And that was that was all I learned socially how to do with people. And um, And then, so, like, after that high school period ended I I tried to go to college once and that didn't like the school the school part's easy the school parts the school part was always like I always thought it's kind of like a racket to me like you you just have to know how to pass tests you have to know what the teachers want from you and do the stuff they want and then you just go and you do it and then you pass it and um and then (laughs) but like the social part was really it was really hard for me um because all I knew how to do was get loaded and raise hell with other kids, you know? Like, that's the only other way I knew how to interact. And this, the school I went to was kind of a little uptight. And, uh, and so I didn't, I didn't really fit in. And then the consequences started kicking in, you know? Because I'm acting the way that I know how to act. And other people are, like, kind of, you know, like, taken aback by it a little bit. And, um, and then consequences, consequences, until the point when I was like, I should probably get the hell out of here. Um... And so I left, and it was because they were all square, you know, colleges played out, and, like, I don't, I'm not, that's not for me, I'm going to go be me, you know, and uh, so I went, I wound up moving out to Seattle with my sister, who, she was out here, you know, getting loaded and raising hell, and so I was like, yes, like, I'm coming there too, and, um, and I got to live on Capitol Hill with a bunch of, you know, 
drunks and punks and all that stuff and have a blast for the most part. And the, I mean, there were consequences, but whatever. I mean, I was like in my early 20s, it was a blast for the most of it. And then eventually time goes on and consequences, consequences, consequences. And, um, you know, burning bridges and stuff and, and, uh, kind of the one speed that I have built into me just makes it, it makes it hard to have people not dislike me. And, uh, and so like, even out here, I got to the point where I was like, all right, you know, I did everything I needed to do out here. I got to do a lot of really cool, like fun stuff, but you know, all these people are stupid. Like they're going nowhere. Like I'm going to go back to school, you know? And so I decided, I and, and I even like, you know, kind of sobered up to try to do this, to go back to school. And, um, and I did that for, for a little while. So, so what I wanted to do in school was I always wanted to be, I always wanted to be a pilot. I always wanted to be a pilot in the military. And, uh, you know, that was since I was a kid. And it's on, it's on, uh, Netflix now, but I used to watch that show Robotech when I was a little kid. <laughs> and it had, um, like it had guys who flew around in like jets that turn into robots in space and they like fought aliens and stuff. And it was amazing. And I knew <laughs> that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And, um, and so if anybody was ever going to have jets that turned into robots, then flew around in space, was going to be in the military. So I eventually <laughs> had to fly for the military. And, uh, and it, I didn't ever see that as being something that was non-attainable to me. And, um, and so I went, I went back to school. I, and when I say sobered up, it was because I didn't, I didn't have AA. I didn't really know anything about sobriety. I went to maybe a handful of meetings when people were like, Akita, you need to go to a meeting. And, uh, and, but it never, it never meant anything to me. It was kind of just something I would like sweat through and then go drink after. And, uh, and so I went back, I was really serious about it. And I, I I drink every once in a while, you know, like when nobody was looking and like I could kind of play it off like nothing happened and uh but not then like most of the drugs and stuff that I was doing that all stopped and um mostly just because I couldn't handle it and they're too much of a hassle and stuff but drinking I mean dollar 50 at any corner and I could get a 40 ounce of malt liquor and that's all that I need. You know, I don't need to go through the, the rigmarole of looking for a drug dealer or something. Like I can get plenty wasted off of nothing. They're like kids need booze, you know, and I can buy them booze and then I keep their change and get myself something. And, uh, so like I, I kind of stuck to the drinking for a while and I, but then when I went back to school, I stopped and, just because I knew it would get me in trouble, and uh, and while I was there, I was doing good. I was pretty, I was pretty straight and narrow. Uh, it's funny. It's funny when I say things like that, and then I think about what I was actually doing. I was like, it's not right, that straight and narrow. But um, <laughs> but like, cause I, so I was talking. I was talking to a buddy of mine earlier today, uh, who who like I work out with and stuff, and he, we were just kind of talking about about sobriety and stuff, cause he's in recovery too, and talking about my, one of the things that I realized, I got sober in a treatment center, one of the things I realized was that, like, my biggest problem was that I can't make it through the day without a head change. I need some kind of head change throughout the day, regardless of where it comes from, what it is. Like, the idea of waking up and going through the whole day until I go back to bed without anything to make it better, you know, like, I don't know. I didn't know how to do that. And um, so then that was the same thing when I was going to school. Like, I was with all these, you know, like, engineers and piloty nerd kids and uh and they i would like take their like model airplane glue and like huff it until i like hallucinated you know and um and i do these things i'd be like oh i can't drink i can't smoke weed because we had drug tested here so like i need something you know and like have a dip in my mouth and smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and like doing anything that i can do to legally you know get myself kind of twisted a little bit and um and then eventually all the stuff was going good with the with the military thing and then I went in for my medical and they were like uh they're like so we're going to ask you all these questions like they shipped us off to this place in Phoenix and um they were like we're going to ask you all the stuff if anything ever comes back to us about anything that's not true on here like it's real serious it's a real big deal and um 
Oh, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. Excuse me one moment. Um, but yeah, uh, they, they're they like, you have to be honest. Honesty, honesty, honesty. And I was like, all right, it's fine. Like, it's been a long time since I've done anything. And uh, I'll be completely honest with these guys. And um, then went through the whole process. And then I was in the place with my recruiter in his office. And he's talking me up about and then, like, this is all great, and he's just kind of thumbing through my paperwork, and he's talking about, like, and then you do this, and then you fly this one, and then you'll probably get shipped off to here, and um, and I'm stoked. Like, I'm feeling really good about everything going really well, and um, and then as he's flipping through my stuff, he stops, and he's like, he's like, well, what's this? And uh, I was like, oh, what? And he said, when I asked you on the phone about prior drug use, you said no. And I was like, I was like, oh, yeah, but all, like, any, all this stuff was, like, a long time ago, so no, it's like it's been a while since I've done any of that. And he was like, well, just the fact that it says on here that you took acid once in your life, it completely disqualifies you from ever being a pilot in the U S military. And, um, and so like my childhood dream, like right there was just like crush, like throw on the ground. And, um, and I was like, uh, the, is there anything that we could do? Like you got a, you know, an eraser or something. And he was just like, no, like it's on here. Like it's signed by the doctor. There's nothing that we can do about this. And, um, and so that was it, you know? So like what? And so I left, I broke my hand in the elevator, you know? And, uh, and I went and I walked to the first liquor store I could find. And, um, and that was in like 2000, I think. And I didn't stop drinking until 2006. And, um, and so I, I drank, I drank while I was in school. I drank while I was flying. I, I remember, uh, driving up to the airport with my head out of the window and one eye closed, you know, to go up pre-flight an airplane and go fly it for like an hour and come back and not remember the flight at all. And, uh, yeah. And then eventually, you know, I, I wound up, you know, knocking up my neighbor and, uh, and, and quit in school. And like, you know, it was, I was, I was in a spiral and, um, and then, you know, I, uh, like, I think I, I think I like, drunk drove across the country or something and go home and kind of clear my head. And and then uh, I decided me and my son's mom were like, well, we'll work it out. You know, we'll make everything work. And um, we tried, you know, I got I got I got sober again for a little while and it was pretty good, you know, through most of the pregnancy and like about the first year of the kid's life. And um, but then eventually it was it's the same the same thing where it's like uh you know, eh, the neighbors smoke a little bit of weed. I'm just going to like take a little toke before we watch this movie or something. And then it was, because I didn't have AA. I didn't have anything. I kind of had a goal that I was going to do. And I was like, yeah, we're together. Everything is fine. You know, I did it. And, like, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a, or if I am, it's just, it's the funny, ha-ha, I'm an alcoholic thing. You know, but, uh, and so, like, and then, well, I'm just going to have, like, two beers. I'll never drink more than two beers in a night, you know. A six-pack will last me three days, and a six-pack is kind of the equivalent of a 40 and a 22, right? And then if 140 is a regular beer, and then it's a 22 of malt liquor, and then I start doing all that, you know, kind of fugazi math, and then I'm just, I'm drinking the way that I do, you know? And um, it doesn't take long, and I'm drinking the only way that I know how to drink. And, uh, and so, you know... The relationship thing with the son's mom did not work at all. And that's, that is what it is. It wasn't, I mean, it was a big deal when I first got sober because everything in the world was her fault, but I wound up becoming a single parent and, um, and I was a martyr because I was the first single parent ever. And, uh, and nobody knew, nobody knew how bad it was. And, um, and then, uh, I was, I was no good. I was no good to anybody. I was, um, you know, like, I'd leave the kid, I'd drive with him drunk in the car, I'd, you know, I'd put him, I'd put most of the weight on my parents to take care of him while I would be a martyr and go out and do what I do, and, uh, and then eventually, you know, like, my home was falling down around me, I was living with my parents, I was, like, too old to be living with my parents, and I was living with my parents, and, um, and we, like, it was in the house I grew up in and it was like falling down around them. They're getting older and stuff. I'm not contributing hardly anything. And, uh, then my whole family decides we're going to wagon train it out to Seattle and we're all coming out here and we're living out here. And, um, we came out here and that's when, when things got real, real exciting. Um, 
because I started realizing, like, just being in more of an urban area, drugs are so much e more easily accessible, you know, so I started doing a lot harder drugs, and as I started doing that, the consequences really started kind of skyrocketing, and, um, you know, like, just, like, the violence, like, the physical pain, you know, that comes along with stuff really, like, kind of grew, and, uh, and eventually it was to the point where, oh, like, uh, the turning point, like, the real, the real turning point for me was, um, I was in this motel on Aurora doing what you do in motels on Aurora, and, uh, and I was smoking some, I know this is an AA meeting, but I was doing that thing where you smoke the stuff out of the skinny little glass pipe that's really close to your mouth, and I wound up burning my throat really bad, and, like, I remember, uh, like, I couldn't swallow, like, the room was closing in on me and everything, and, um, and then I kind of broke, so I used to be pretty good, like, I used to be fairly invincible as far as this stuff goes, and, uh, but then it was, like, after that, it was just, like, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, like, smoke a cigarette hardly without, like, gagging and hacking, and I was throwing up black and brown stuff and, like, choking on foam and, like, all these, like, it was, it was a nightmare, it was really bad, like, my health had broken, and I was, I was pretty much sure that I was about to die, that, like, maybe I had months left if I was lucky. And, uh, because things were, things were bad. And, um, and then I remember dragging myself home one day and, uh, it, it, like in the morning or something. And I was still, I was still kind of leeching off of my parents. And, um, I came in and my dad looked at me and, and I, cause I'd made up my mind. I was like, I'm dying. So like, I'm just going to go, you know, I'm just going to go die like alone and out of everyone else's hair, because that's the right thing to do, right? That's, like, the kindest thing I could do for other people, is go die in silence, and, um, and so I was going to take, like, the last amount of money I had from the last job I got fired from, and go get a bus ticket and go back out to Arizona, and just, you know, drink myself off in the woods somewhere, um, and I was telling my dad this, you know, I was like, I, you, I'm going to get, you need to get custody of my son, because I got to go. And, uh, and he was like, I remember looking at him, like, it kind of sucks when you look at your dad and you see like your dad looking at you crying, like who's supposed to be like a strong man, you know? And like, he's like welling up with tears and stuff. And he was like, J and he doesn't know anything, you know? And he's like, just try to go to rehab or something. And, um, it's like, whatever, you know? And I went and I went to sleep. I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor in the basement of the house that we were in. And, um. And I woke up and my son was lying next to me. And I remember looking at him and being like, being like, God damn it. You know, like I couldn't, I couldn't do it right then. You know, so I was like, I, I'll try, I'll, I'll make a couple phone calls. And if I can get into treatment this weekend, you know, I'll give it a shot. If it doesn't, if this isn't right, then I could still do the other thing. That's always an option. And, um, and so I called up recovery centers of King County, RC Casey, and, uh, and they told me that um, they could get me a bed in their detox the next day. And um, and that wasn't the best news at the time, but um, but it was the news that they gave me, you know. And so, and I'd said I was going to do it. Like, I'd made a, I'd said to myself, if I can do this this weekend, I'll do it. And they were like, yeah, we got a space for you, like, right now, you know. And um, so I got all loaded that night made the made the arrangements got all wasted that night showed up nice and drunk uh i remember i remember hitting on the receptionist as i was checking into treatment and um i'm sure that's a great look for anybody and uh and that so that place i used to i used to bring panel meetings there all the time like i i loved that place and it's since been closed down because it was a king county deal and um I don't know. I don't really know the details of it, but some shit happened and it got shut down. And, uh, but man, I love that place because that place without a shadow of a doubt saved my life. You know, I knew nothing. I remember being in there, being in the detox part where they gave us the little cups with pills in it and we're like, eat this and yeah, yeah, okay. And then eat it and then fall asleep and not like, and, but then they have a treatment center, like an actual like inpatient treatment center downstairs from the detox. And I, count my sobriety date as when I stepped into that, the treatment part downstairs. And, um, I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't know how to eat right. I didn't know how to, how to, you know, have like 
good personal hygiene or anything or like how to like like the benefits of making my bed every morning you know like little human being things i had to learn there and uh and it was great you know that place it was it was no frills it was like a like a bomb shelter kind of and uh and they get um they take us for walks like once a week and uh but man i loved it cuz it i got to see some there's this one counselor there um i don't remember what his what his whole name i don't think he even told us what his whole name was but his name was mike and uh and he talked about smoking crack. He talked about being homeless. He talked about doing all the things that I did. And um, and he was like, he he had a glow about him. He was like the happiest, coolest, like most energetic guy you could meet. And um, and I knew he wasn't lying to me when he talked about being sober. Like when he talked about how he doesn't do anything to get a head change all day. I believed it. And I believed when he said like, I've been here because there's some things that, you know, like, like you don't know, like, it's not like you're not going to be able to make it up because you saw it in a movie or something like, do you, like you had to have lived the kind of miserable life that I lived to know what certain things are like. And he said all that stuff. And I was like, that guy really did all this stuff. And he's really sober right now. So like, and I, I mean, I had nothing, like I had nothing going for me. And, um, but it gave me that, gave me that glimmer of hope, you know? And uh, and in there, like, I heard all the statistics and stuff about how, like, one in every hundred people who goes to treatment actually stays sober more than a month or anything. And I didn't care because I, I was desperate. And I said, if, if it's one in a billion, I'll be the one. You know, I don't care. I'm doing I'm, – I want this, you know, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this. And, uh, and they told me, um, when you leave here, uh, know the first meeting you're going to go to and know the second meeting that you're going to go to. And um, said, have a schedule book. And so I did. You know, I had a schedule book. I knew the first meeting I was going to go to. I got out. I went. I was in the car with my parents for like five minutes. And I was like, take me back to the treatment center. <laughs> and, uh, and But they couldn't, you know, because I was done. I did my 28 days there. And so, um, but what they could do was they took me to um, Fremont Fellowship Hall up on Aurora. And I went in there, and it was perfect. It was like, it was, it was just what I needed. It was the same vibe that I had in the treatment center. Everything about it was just right for me at that time. And, um, and I was able to be in there for that hour and a half that the meeting lasted. And then I left and I was home for like an hour maybe. And I was like, what the, what do I do? Like, what do I do with myself? And, um, I had no idea, but I knew the second meeting I was going to go to. And that was early birds by Green Lake. And that was the second meeting I went to. And I went in there and I felt so out of place. I I felt like I did not belong in that room at all. And um, and there are some people here who might be able to tell you stories about how awkward I was at those first meetings at Early Birds. And um, but yeah, uh, but I still went. And one of the things I got to see was that AA has everything, you know, across the board. Like if I need if I need to be around people who look like they maybe still smoked crack that day, I can find that. You know, in AA. And if I need to be around people who look like they're, like, business owners, you know, or, like, I don't even know, like, the mayor or something everybody looked like to me at some of these meetings. And, uh, and like, if I want to find that, like, I could find, I could find the whole, like, gamut of experience. And the thing about going to some of these other, going to the variety of meetings that I went to was I got to see that we were all alcoholics. Because uh, I remember, I remember at Early Birds, one of the things that happened there was, uh, when, like, somebody, it really caught me, because, like, when people shared, they, they shared, they had the same stories that the people at Fremont had, you know, they just looked a lot different, but it was still the same stories, the same, the same pain, the same misery, the same stuff that I could relate to, they just looked different, and, um, kind of carried themselves different, you know, but it was the same stuff, and, uh, and everybody was still nuts, you know, like, I remember somebody got up out of a seat, and someone took it, somebody else, woman came and sat in her seat, the, the person who was there before came over and was like, so I was sitting here, and she looked her in the face and said, stadium seating, bitch. And, I, and that woman may or may not be in the room tonight, but I, I, remember, I remember being like, oh, my God, these people are nuts. And but being, like, it made me feel so comfortable. Like, it made me feel like, like I could really 
do this thing, you know? And, uh, and, <laughs> and, it, and, every, and like, the people around laughed, and so I was like, this is, this is, like, good, this is, this is, these are real people here, you know? And, um, and so I did it. I went to, I went to a ton of meetings, you know? The schedule book was my best friend for the, for a long time, you know, because I didn't know what to do, you know? It's, it's five o'clock on a Wednesday, you know? What does a person do when they're not going to the bar? You know, what do you do? I have no idea, but I take out my schedule book. There's a meeting in an hour at this place. That's what I'm doing for the next hour. You know, and that's what I'm doing for the hour until that meeting starts is, you know, holding onto my ass until that meeting starts. And, um, and then eventually I started getting a life. You know, I started, um, I had a schedule. I decided one group was going to be my home group. I got a service position there. Um, it gave me a place to be every day. And, uh, I still didn't know how to act. It was living in sobriety down down the street at uh, 65th and 12th. And um, I remember I'd show up, like, the days when I had to make coffee there were, like, the most agonizing days because I had to be there early. And I had no idea how to talk to people, you know? So, like, I'd get in early, I'd make the coffee, and I'd, like, I would bail out and just, like, go, like, sit on the stairs, like, away from the meeting so I didn't have to be near people who were going to try to talk to me. And, like, the meeting would end, and it would be, like, and we're all worth it. And if, like, out, you know, and, but, and there, so there was one guy at that meeting who used to, I'd leave out the back door, he'd leave out the front door and intercept me every day when I'd be leaving. And he'd say, see you next time, Akita. And, uh, and I'd be like, what the fucking, and then I'd walk by him. But then eventually I was able to say like, okay, you know, and like, and then walk by him. And then eventually it was like, like, good to see you too, you know, and like, ease, like, ease myself into, like, being a normal human being who can interact with other people, and, uh, and it's, I don't know, it's been, it's been a, it's been a gift, this whole thing, uh, eventually got a sponsor, you know, I got a sponsor, my first sponsor was, it wanted me to do, wanted me to read a book that I was incapable of reading at that time before we did anything, and so I dreaded having to call him, want me to call him every day, I'd call as late as possible, and if it didn't go to voicemail, I'd be like furious. Uh, and and then it wasn't it wasn't for me. And then I met another guy who was like, "Yeah, let's just meet up, let's just talk," you know. And then we met up once a week. We read out of the twelve and twelve, and we eventually made it through all the steps. And um, and my life has completely changed. You know, the life that I have now is like. There's, there's no comparison, you know, like there's, I have no interest in going back to being, you know, the little drunk monster who used to sleep in the bushes, you know, and stuff like I'm not interested in that. Like I have, like, I've got a career, you know, I've got like a, I've got a family of like my own making around me. And, uh, you know, like the things that I, the things I get to do that like I'm privileged enough to do, like I'm, I'm doing stuff I used to dream about as a kid, like literally things that I used to dream about. Um, I get to do for real, you know, and uh, yeah, so the opportunities don't just stop showing up, but they only show up for me when I'm taking care of this business right here. You know, I keep putting one foot in front of the other. I make sure I'm trying to be the best Akita I can be every day. And then the world just keeps opening up for me and uh, got a little bit of a moral compass. So I'm kind of, you know, not all the time, but I'm pretty good at being able to tell what I should and what I shouldn't be doing because I've spent the time, you know, putting in the reps and getting practice at actually doing that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. And it's also really cool to be able to come to this meeting because I remember when um, one anonymous member here was starting up this meeting. And that's kind of awesome that I get to be around here and watch things change and be able to come into a room and hear so many Here's so many new people talk about being in here, you know, people with day counts. It's the best. Like, it's, it's really an honor that you guys asked me to come in here and, and talk to you tonight. So thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.